welcome uh, everybody uh, for this uh, um, new day of uh, with many exciting lectures. Uh, so before we start, just a reminder of the a uh, few rules on how to ask questions. So if you're following from YouTube, you can ask questions in the chat and I'll read them for you. If you are uh, connected to Zoom, you can either pause them in the chat or um, use the raise and feature of Zoom. Great, so uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce again uh, Andrea Rinaldo, who is giving the second of three uh, lectures. So thank you very much, Andrea, for being with us. Please, you can share the screen when you are ready. Thank you so much, uh, Jacopo. And uh, let me go back uh, to the screen. I assume that uh, unless I hear um, you lamenting that you don't see, I would assume that uh, my full screen will be uh, visible to you all. So I come back to my um, to the uh, the second of three classes on river networks as ecological corridors. I will subtitle species, population, and pathogens. You may remember if you attended the previous one that um, uh, essentially the the the, the light motif of the, my talks um, is that um, uh, we claim that uh, uh, the dendritic substrates uh, like uh, uh, river network instead with certain recurrent properties that uh, we have analyzed however briefly uh, but um, those dendritic substrates for ecological interactions uh, uh, bear important consequences for a number of processes that um, we'll be analyzing uh, that is essentially patterns of biodiversity which i haven't done i'll do today in part um, uh, the con the, reverse, the spread of uh, species along uh, along uh, uh, the network cells, or biological invasions in a sense, and um, uh, the spread of waterborne disease, which we'll see in my last uh, class with reference to epidemic cholera and endemic disease like proliferative kidney disease in fish. And uh, the idea is that the system is so constrained by the substrate, the nature of the substrate, the recurrent properties, the non local properties embedded in it. But in reality, it would endow the system um, a, a certain degree of predictability beyond what was originally thought. And uh, so what we have seen last, um, last uh, uh, in, during the first class was that um, um, once um, you put those constraints in place and you use even the, the simplest possible model, in that case was a neutral model of biodiversity, whether you're using a metapopulation model or a meta-community model, whether you're using nearest neighbor interactions, or you're taking a kernel, which goes from a certain discrete length or a mean field approach in which you average over uh, the whole ensemble for replacing, for getting replacements, or randomly selected uh, species removed from a single site, um, the system tends to have certain uh, indication that is, the very nature of a substrate of interactions with the dendritic network has important consequences, which we have later verified by a number of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, different uh, tools. So uh, the main argument that um, I put together, uh, and uh, it's a one I said that um, what these lectures try to do, we to draw together several line of arguments to suggest that an integrated eco-hydrology framework that blends laboratory field and theoretical evidence um, has contributed substantially to our understanding of the form and function of uh, the river network. What I shall do today, I shall begin with talking about um, biological invasions, possibly biological invasions on, on fractal supports, like uh, a, a tree, uh, which is uh, the, uh, the ones that we have seen in the case of river networks. So and what you see in here is a map of invasion of the zebra mussel uh, along the Mississippi-Missouri River system in the northern United States. And you see different colors by different colors what happened to a species was completely alien and introduced by accident um, into the system. We're talking about hydrochory and um, to make a first example, we're talking about human range expansions and the population migrations um, in, in the past, which is um, an interesting idea by the group of uh, Spanish physicists which I'll be putting forth. Uh, today. So first, uh, let me start uh, with the standard things many of you have uh, seen in a number of contexts, and it is the fisher kolmogorov uh, uh, traveling wave uh, approach to a system. So if you have a model in which you have um, dispersion rho, in this case, is like um, a density uh, of a species, or you name it, or any kind, 
moving along a one D a one dimensional support. And mind you that in the case of Raven networks, it makes absolutely good sense to think of a one dimensional system in intrinsic coordinates because the width and the depth of a river cross section are much smaller than the longitudinal length you have to travel. So the assumption that making open channel flows and flows in pipe, et cetera, as a one dimensional thing, it's absolutely a, a standard assumption verified by hundreds of years of practice. So essentially what we say is, suppose that the system would be a simple diffusion with constant coefficient. So the term D, uh, D square rho of the DX square coupled to a significant over the time scale of diffusion um, reproduction uh, uh, system. That is, in this case, a logistic equation in which uh, you essentially, the reproduction of a density follows initial phase, which is the exponential growth phase, the Malthusian so-called dynamics, later on curved by reaching an asymptote. So the growth term is, is uh, nil, either where the density is zero, or where rho reaches a carrying capacity k. Why this is interesting, it's been studied for a long time and notably from the most uh, gifted applied mathematician of the last century, Kolmogorov, in fact, and R.A. Fisher, the inventor of so many uh, uh, results that are crucial now to uh, modern genetics and molecular medicine, et cetera. Uh, they studied the game uh, under different angles but saw the same result. What happens if you look, if you suppose that, for instance, you start to generate at a single point in space over a length L, and a single, you inject uh, a single shot uh, of a certain number of organisms of the species whose density we plan to analyze, uh, the system here is known uh, to generate a solid tone, that is an undeformed wave after a short while that propagates uh, without um, the constant celerity, if it obeys this equation, which is solely dictated by the value of the growth rate inverse of time and the diffusion coefficient, square uh, length squared divided by time, to generate a characteristic velocity, which is twice the square root of a times d. How do you uh, prove this result? Well, it's an interesting point, which you essentially take the diffusion equation uh, under this limiting term, and you do that initially by assuming that this term is negligible. And uh, what you have is that you can calculate the expansion radius of the most of a mass or a assigned fraction of a mass, which you have um, in your uh, system and um, how this expands in time. Thereby, what you're studying is the behavior, and that has an important feature for what concerns our capability to de describe the network effect. What happens in the vicinity of a low density when this starts propagating actually? So the idea is that if you calculate the expansion radius, that um, in a regime in which uh, um, this log of a quantity, whatever you want to have it, pales compared to the term in which you have the square dependence of the square root of a radius. So the velocity of a speed is essentially twice uh, uh, d times r, which is the growth rate in the Malthusian model in which you eliminate, uh, in which you eliminate uh, the uh, carrying capacity effect. And by no surprise, the carrying capacity, even if you extend this, it can be shown that the front speed is essentially, in the case of the Malthusian dynamics, still what happens in the vicinity of this reaction term for which the density approaches zero. And, um, and uh, that's not by chance, because what we are saying is that, so essentially the same result of the Malthusian population, which if you take uh, a proper computation of the expanding radius uh, for a Malthusian population, uh, and uh, through the curve here, and uh, the, uh, the uh, actual solution of the system, which you, have, you see that quite um, soon, the system behaves exactly in the same manner. So what is interesting is that uh, in a two-dimensional system, for instance, or in an isotropic migration system, one, two, three n dimensions, whatever you have it, the system will have essentially that the speed of a traveling wave or the organism generated that will reach a plateau and stay there and propagate on the fold, it's proportional to the, these two coefficients, ignoring the effect of the carrying capacity, which is immaterial, but only depending on the diffusion coefficient and the rate of reproduction, the reproduction rate one at a time. This thereby in an, um, say, Eulerian support, that is in one, two dimensions, et cetera. And this will have um, uh, some importance in what follows. 
Now, what is interesting thereby is that um, uh, what matters, and that is important uh, for the particular substrate we are studying, which is a tree that is a unique path for any node to any other node. It's a directed graph in which there is a sense of direction which is embedded in the structure of the system of noisy diffusion. And so essentially you can map the evolution of a density of organisms in space and time as a rescale variable of an undeformed property, which is the uh, typical uh, structure of the characteristic curve, which I need there. So the fact that what matters is what happens in the vicinity of a zero density is important whenever you have to look at systems like this one. This is Peano network, which I introduced um, uh, the, uh, uh, like during the last uh, question there. Why am I using Peano? I'm using Peano because it's a deterministic fractal rediscovered Giuseppe Peano, the Italian mathematician who wrote a famous paper over a curve that fills the entire plane, which was considered like a, 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 a blunder by mathematicians of this area, and we're still studying it 100 years afterwards. Mendel, Benoit Mendelbrot, the genius of Mendelbrot, rediscovered it to support his idea that, um, uh, that mountains are no cones, uh, uh, coastlines are not uh, broken lines, nor travel does travel in straight lines. The fact that the, after 2000 years after Euclid, we started looking at the geometry of nature with different eyes was embedded in a curve, which is strictly deterministically self-similar because it's created by a process where it's from the originator. You essentially do the, uh, the system which have broken down half of a segment here, adding it into a system of this kind. And that allows you to calculate exactly a number of properties. Why this is an interesting feature? Because um, um, if you look at topological properties, of course, if you look at that, you say, this is not a river network. Of course it's not. But it allows you to calculate um, uh, certain quantities exactly. For instance, if you count the number of, suppose this is a directed graph and you can count, and if you suppose you have a seed point like here, for instance, or in this case it would be here, if you assume that the, the thickness of a line is proportional to the total contributing area, it's a tree, so in any place you can calculate the number of nodes you have upstream. And what is interesting is that you can calculate exactly uh, the number of sites equally distant from the outlet, uh, distance being calculated in what is called normally chemical distance, that is along the structure of a network itself. Which is hydrologically is a very important quantity because if you suppose that it rains uh, a given quantity in every single node of that, the distance, if a system behaves, in a dynamically constant way, which means the arrival time at the outlet. So essentially, the response of the system will be related to this quantity. And in the case of Peano, this is an interesting thing because this is a binomial multiplicative process solved exactly. It's an exact multifractal that has been studied by many, including Mendelbrot itself. In this case, what is specific of that is that even if by looking at this, you know that this is not a river network, however, the topological properties, which are non-distinctive in many respects, almost statistically inevitable, the topological structure of this is exactly indistinguishable, like bifurcation numbers, lengths, etc., from the ones exhibited by river networks. So the message I'm conveying here is that in this case, you can study exactly the behavior of a traveling wave along this backbone of propagation, for instance, because you can calculate exactly the number of bifurcations that the system will experience in its traveling downstream. So if you solve this numerically, uh, this is, let me show it directly. Um, what you see, it's a diffusion plus a reaction term, a logistic reaction term happening in this sense, what you see in here. And this is how the system propagates. Um, what is interesting is that if you take the longitudinal direction, what matters, for instance, from going from source to outlet, I put it for clarity horizontally, but it could be even any source term would have exactly the same behavior. What happens is that if you do this, so this is how the paw propagates uh, into the system, depending on different features. In this case, you have like no drift. I later on examine the case would have a significant hydrodynamic degree, uh, drift. And uh, what happens here is that you're going to have a system in which the jag part here is due to the uh, heterogeneity is generated by the structure itself, but it generates a traveling wave. And what is phenomenal is that a walker that is at sight on the backbone, 
can spare a certain time of a secondary branch. If you go here and you get sidetracked in this direction, you spend some time around the system here before you can eventually plug back and continue your travel towards the outlet. So the main point is that um, uh, if you go through a system which is one dimensional, but with significant delays because of a side tracking of the structure, essentially produces a slowing of the speed of a traveling front. So if you are only interested in the behavior of a system along the backbone, you can interpret the secondary branches as essentially a producer of the delay between sides of the backbone. So delays could be chemical, physical, biological reactions, but generates essentially of lifetime distributions because that's what I'm interested in, into your system. And uh, you can do that by a technique called continuous time random walk. I'm just uh, leaving a few slides in here, but you have the density of a point is something which you take into account the, the, the probability that you have of staying, you have a distribution of the delay time in a node. And mind you, the delay time in a node at this point is the time you spend, if you get kicked out in one of the side structures, how long would you spend in the side pockets before you jump into the mainstream? And that's a distribution of a, uh, uh, of a lifetime in here. And then you have also a term which describes the jump at every side which in this case we call it reactive random walk because you assume that every time step you have a, with probability one half, uh, you go back and forth, you have the system, you have some bifurcation, or if you have Z nearest neighbors, you have a probability one over Z uh, of jumping in one of the, of the ones you have. So a long story short, this can be treated um, by Laplace transforms. It's called hamilton jacobi mechanism. And you can calculate, in fact, uh, 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 fairly well via yeah, Laplace transforms how the system behaves. So you can calculate, you create the Kolmogorov-Fisher um, system for the homogeneous n-dimensional, but in particular one-dimensional system, the speed of propagation of a solid tone that will be generated by the diffusion plus a logistic reaction term in this particular case. And in the case of piano network in particular, you can do that exactly. So. Uh, long story short, if anybody's interested, I told you that in the book that uh, Marino Gatto, Ignacio Rodriguez, and myself have just published, there is a complete derivation of that. That speed, in fact, turns out to be something which is, if you look at the size of a jump, which you assume that the system would have uh, in discrete space and continuous time, would be delta squared divided by tau, the mean waiting time of the system. You can see that this is the equivalent of the speed of the other, and uh, this is the equivalent of a coefficient. So it's twice the square root of R times, or A times D, but divided by a coefficient, which is essentially the convolution of the waiting times you have outside the backbone over which you propagate, which is larger than one. So a theoretical prediction on an abstract model, again, uh, on a particular structure is telling you that in principle, you should have but in piano, you can calculate it exactly when you can do it numerically in any other case. The heterogeneity generated by the bifurcation structure that you will face propagating in one direction slows the front. And indeed, that's what happens. So if you take a two dimensional system, um, this is what you have in the two dimensional system of this kind. Like uh, this is the you inject into a particular place, oops, and you see how this propagates in space isotropically and the speed is twice the square root of A times D. And almost regardless of a particular network structure, for Peano, you have an exact solution. For OCNs, which you have seen the other time, you have something of the same kind. You have systematically um, a, 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 a slower speed of propagation. You may uh, wonder who cares. And uh, to do that, um, I resort to uh, something which I find absolutely fascinating. A group of Spaniard physicists uh, wrote on theoretical population biology in 2006, I started uh, our interest in the subject, um, studied a quantitative model for the, col uh, for the American colonization of, the, of a, the, the race towards uh, the West in the 19th century, uh, as seen through the lenses of transport of a fractal network. So the idea is that um, the landscape heterogeneities and the need of water forced the settlers 
about Fluvio courses. That is, uh, any settler will move along a, a fractal, in fact, because we move along a river and only crossing divides at small times when they cross the, the divides, like the Rockies or whatever. Why do they need the Fluvia courses? Because they need the, the water resources, cause for drinking, energy, transportation, whatever. And, um, and uh, the idea of an exact reaction diffusion model uh, seems like a sensible way about a river network. Uh, and uh, it's in which you would have that uh, the population growth will be logistic with the rate parameter uh, A for population growth as a single node. Well, what is remarkable that the archives of the US Congress allows you to evaluate, in fact, how the colonization came about. And uh, what uh, this guy has is that you had the yearly uh, value of a relative frequency of a, that is the distribution of um, uh, uh, the relative frequency of the distance crossed year by year by the colonizers in different directions. And uh, thereby, one of the key parameters that you have to calculate that uh, the system would have been the phi distribution of the distribution of the jumps and uh, was uh, actually given and uh, didn't need to be calibrated at all. And what is totally remarkable, if you take that, so you had essentially the growth rate from the archives of a population growth, you have a distribution of a, the features of a, uh, uh, of a random walk in space, the distribution of the jumps that is, they, the settlers would go about uh, over in an isotropic march towards the west. And what you had at the Fisher Bridge, which is then you have the parameters twice the square root of A times T, would be of the order of 40 kilometers per year. What is totally remarkable is that if you take any simulation, any kind of assumptions, etc., you go immediately uh, to speeds of the order of 14 uh, kilometers per year. And mind you, that the actual observed speed of the expansion was of the order of 1.3, 13.5. So the idea is that the data suggest that indeed, even in this case, the very nature of the substrate, in this case for the population, uh, uh, for population dynamics, uh, was the one dominated by the features of a river network itself because of the constraints that we have imposed on the system. This can be, so this is again the picture, so the constraints that we have imposed on the backbone of propagation of the traveling waves, facing the bifurcation that I will once with you, we see inevitably uh, the, the topological properties, that is the properties of a, the, the bifurcations that you would face um, along your path on any particular backbone will be the same. In this structure, which is statistically identical to a true river network, uh, but replicate, uh, uh, replicable, et cetera, like we have seen in the case of OCN and the piano network, in fact, behave very much in the same manner. So yet another indication that um, the substrate plays a major role in the uh, ecology of the system. So like I did, uh, like I showed you the other time, the first thing that we did is said, okay, it's a strong suggestion. And can we study in the laboratory the, uh, what happened? So uh, we had developed the ability in my lab to work with protists. And so you have these essentially protistodromes, if you want. So we made these running places uh, and we see how we can measure it by a more or less uh, um, a progressively more refined tools, et cetera, how an injected population in one end can invade and the speed at which it invades the system. So this looks like a Kandinsky picture, but is essentially the trace taken with microscopy done in my lab of individual trajectories of every single protist moving in this direction. And mind you that the, one of the two, di the, the two dimensions were much smaller uh, than, uh, than the, the longitudinal one, thereby making the one dimensional assumption reasonable. So I am interested in how heterogeneity slows the front. And one would be to test uh, how the demographic stoch stochasticity pitches in with the respect to the fischer kolmogorov model of invasion. So essentially what well, we took the model of this kind and we decoupled essentially space from uh, the intrinsic noise which you have in the system. Mind you that different realizations of the protist uh, run through the system are things of this kind. So replication was absolutely needed to see how the system behaves. But the point is that if you do this and you replicate these normally, which had the 95% range, you see that still 
in a context in which you have, uh, there's nothing neutral in here. There's nothing but demographic stochasticity induced by the biology of the system. And still, what is phenomenal is that the uh, fischer kolmogorov system proves able to reproduce with a remarkable accuracy what happens in the laboratory. So interestingly enough, um, we would see, okay, now, can we generate other kinds of heterogeneity in the system? And how can you do that? When one idea was to use phototaxis in biological invasions, and, um, and the idea is to use uh, the generalized receptor law, because you have a system in which every node, essentially, you have a reaction in a node, and you have transport uh, uh, among nodes. So uh, the idea is to use uh, the phototaxis in a system of this kind. This is my, uh, the, 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 the runner, the drome, the, the stadium for this protease to run, the injection point and the collection point. And what we have in a phototactic system would be to use LEDs to generate resources heterogeneously distributed um, in space, which hadn't been done before. And uh, slowing invasion by heterogeneous environments is one of the tenets uh, in which I've been uh, trying to uh, get you interested in and as you always seen. So the idea is that, for instance, heterogeneity could be spatial heterogeneity, in which, for instance, you put some drift in a system, so you put a bias in the system, not simple diffusion, but you add um, advection, which makes it even more heterogeneous, of course, because advection, in this case, you assume um, constant through the system, and you have a probability in any node, what you have is a probability, which is an even probability of splitting um, in the case of diffusion, and it's not even if you have um, drift of any kind. So essentially, what you have in the system, if you be a parameter that unifies with drift, what you get is that uh, this is the wave front speed in one case. Uh, so essentially, in the case in which you have um, like zero drift in the square root of a t, like you have it in the core of system, up to a system which is completely dominated by advection, which is important because I'm interested in studying the persistence of species in a river network season ecological corridor. So drift may or may not be important depending on ecologically viable quantities, like uh, the nature of the organism we are discussing. So anyways, what we know is that the Hamilton-Jacobi method we have used and the numerical simulations match fairly well. And if you instead put drifts, you start having negative and positive, positive fissure waves. And you can have like, approximations, which are important in this case, which I'll briefly talk about the so-called telegraph equation. Peano then stays in the system with features that are calculated exactly. Of course, I won't pest you with the details. They are quite involved, but, straight, but again, straightforward and analytically solvable. And again, significant because Peano topologically is indistinguishable from the real river network. Although if you look carefully, you see that other metrics simply do not match. The telegraph equation is also something interesting. Of course, now, for instance, this is what happens if you look at how the system propagates, having chosen uh, three different spots for um, colonizing the system. So this is how, in fact, the system propagation behaves. And there's a certain degree of commonality. There's a degree of commonality in the system here. Now, why the reaction telegraph model against the diffusion? Well, it so happens if you put a drift, uh, what happens is that um, uh, you have to assume that if you use a reaction random walk model, you essentially, unless you do some provisions for it, um, you would assume that uh, the speed of propagation of the jump will be at infinite velocity which is, uh, in fact, uh, it's a complicated thing to digest. Long story short, if you put the proper model, which overcomes the inconsistency, well-known inconsistencies of a diffusion model in the case of bias, in this case, um, long story short, the computational, uh, nothing happens. So the reaction around the world describe what happens in the system, even in the case of drift, fairly well. So back to the system which heterogeneity is imposed by me by choosing a certain distribution of resources with a certain correlation length. For instance, you have like silence, resources, silence. You see, it's a Poisson process, the one we modeled it with in the system here. So we had the ports at the bottom of the channel for changing the distance from the lead, the angle of light propagation and the like to use something which is called the Keller-Siegel framework for calculating how the resource acts like a sort of an advection in the system. 
And uh, I won't get into details. Of course, if you're interested, I'd be delighted to see what, what happens. But what, what is interesting in this case is that we do have a framework. So you turn off a light, the system behaves, and that's very clear from the spectral behavior of the system, behaves like a linear e to the minus uh, the wave number squared times dt. So, um, so it turns out to be a normal diffusion if you turn off a light, and it comes up into something different if you generate a, a light field which aggregates and, and acts as a drift in the system, thereby disturbing the overall behavior of the system. So individual trajectories here are much larger. And um, as you see in the different realizations and different kinds, and yet a coherent picture appears. So this is light intensity profile we're using the experiment. And uh, you see the one spread experiment uh, was done for each landscape and, uh, and thereby you have a, a significant way of studying the system. What is uh, the punchline of these relevant to our case is that um, the mean front propagation that uh, we can compute theoretically through the Keller-Siegel framework and the experimental one, in fact, uh, they show that the speed has a new actor. It, it is the autocorrelation length of the resource field. So heterogeneity appears in the system and affects the propagation of the speed uh, or propagation of the traveling wave. And um, this autocorrelation does slow the speed, as you've seen here. In the case you're having there, is where you have a mean invasion speed computed um, directly without any light field included, the square root of 2D system of it, which is the slope of the system here. So heterogeneity, whether given intrinsic to the uh, structure of the river network, whose architecture and recurring characters were long studying and I, which I have introduced um, uh, in uh, my first class, have an effect. And to jump into something connected, uh, like believe it or not, uh, I'm going to a giant of a field, the late Ilka Hansky, Crawford Prize a few years back, died too early, and whom who, whom we miss sorely, in fact, um, had invented a very important uh, uh, quantity that was key to metapopulation analysis called the metapopulation capacity of a fragmented landscape. That is, he found out that an ecological measure, super sound and uh, quite uh, well established experimentally from field work and from theoretical work that uh, characterizes the suitability of a substrate to um, uh, uh, effect of heterogeneity, in his case, was the fragmentation of a landscape. And there was a main motivation from the ecological viewpoint, of course. So technically, metapopulation capacity is the leading eigenvalue of an appropriate landscape matrix, which I'll explain in a minute. And uh, essentially, the punchline was that um, a species is predicted to persist in a landscape which is the matrix for ecological interaction. In my case, I would put this in, in the, other, in, in the case of river network, is larger than some threshold value, which is different by the properties of a species. And uh, which is essentially the capability to disperse and the capability to, to, uh, uh, to uh, the dispersion capability and the, uh, whatever, the uh, mortality and the reproduction rate. So metapopulation capacity is a number that can be conveniently be used to rank landscapes or for ecological interactions in terms of their capacity to support metapopulations. Uh, metapopulation, of course, is another one of those bold statements, not unlike the neutral model of biodiversity in that metapopulation essentially ignore interspecific um, uh, uh, interactions among species. That means there's no predator prey relations, et cetera. So essentially, it is the intrinsic capacity of one species that determines its ability to survive. On this, I shall not spend um, issues, uh, time, because of the limited time I have, but we have discussed it at length uh, uh, for the implications. So what happens is that um, the key to that is essentially you focus on the probability to be at point I in space, in time, of a focus species, the one whose ability to survive your studying, uh, which is the probability of being present in patch I at time T, which is a balance of colonization and extinction forces. And we just kill out 
the interspecific interactions over which ecologists spent lifetimes in the past. There was a greatness of one of the most, uh, uh, in fact, uh, um, uh, gifted field uh, ecologists of our times, Ilka Hansky himself. So uh, the parties that follow me, rate of change of this probability in time is essentially a balance of uh, the probability of being colonized by different places at distance at places site J at distance Dij measured along the system. And, um, and uh, that multiplies the uh, colonization rate. And then you have uh, a, the extinction rate, which is birth minus death uh, ratios in the two. So the ratio E over C is what determines uh, the feature that you have in there. Now, the main result is that what is lambda M, the, the, the eigenvalue of the system? Well, it's a landscape, it's a, the a maximum eigenvalue of a matrix, which is a landscape matrix, which is essentially, this is the dispersal ability of a species, and this is the distance which you have in the system itself. So it's a, it's a positive matrix, it's a reducible matrix, in fact, so peron frobenius theorem applies, in fact. And um, that's what uh, he found out. And um, if it turns out that if the maximum eigenvalue of this particular landscape matrix, which is very easy to calculate for a landscape like ours, like I show in a minute, the landscape matrix for us, it's easier and more constraining than in, say, a savanna uh, ecosystem like we had seen uh, the other day. So what happens is the following. If you take a path along which an open channel uh, network develops. So we started from an, any particular system and we essentially streamline and simplify a network by assuming that um, uh, uh, the system would tends uh, to minimize its energy dissipation approximating the uh, structures that uh, and the statistics that the river network inevitably has. Well, like it or not, uh, it's some sort of an unintended consequences with a decreasing energy, the string alignment of energy, you have as a bonus, in fact, the best, better viability uh, in abstract terms generated by the river network. So the ecosystem, in a sense, benefits from the physical process that determines the substrate that we are talking about. And, and then, well, there are other issues, but I, I realize that it's, it's, I've been chatting too much, so I'll be skipping fields. But anyways, this is a significant result in terms of the probability the and if you take uh, several realizations of the same um, network, et cetera, you have a band, an error band. And if you have like uh, different kind of mean field versus uh, OCN thing, you see that this is a significant result from a statistical viewpoint. So I'm, uh, I, the last 10 minutes of my talk will be uh, devoted to, can we use the same concept to study river networks and biodiversity? And I will leave to the third and last class, how this in fact is key to evaluate how uh, pathogens spread along river networks and ecological corridors, thereby propagating deadly disease, deadly or chronic disease. So um, what am I saying is that um, in a river network is a set of, is a, an oriented graph, my, my nodes and edges. Edges are physical edges uh, obtained offline by digital terrain maps that we seen last time. You do have reactions, which will be physical, chemical, or, uh, or, or biological reactions, in this case, biological, ecological reactions. And essentially, the links are what uh, uh, act as transport models between nodes. And this applies to individuals, this applies to species, or to populations. So essentially, we can talk about, rather than meta-population, meta-communities. And the first example I want to show is a, a paper which we care, Marino and I care very much for, Lorenzo Mai is the first author, on the metapopulation persistence in, um, in uh, uh, river networks. What happens is the following. Uh, so the, uh, to study uh, metapopulation dynamics uh, uh, can be done by, uh, if, uh, by uh, looking at a system in which you may have like species that live on a substrate of this kind, which eventually might, in fact, get off and move off of the network itself. So the species, we are talking about the metapopulation, uh, and that uh, somewhat foresees what's going to happen with more complex compartmental models for a number of different phenomena. It will be like 
you had like uh, in every node, you had two ecologically distinct developmental stages. So we split the population uh, living in the node, uh, which is a reach, if you please, in, in the young non-reproductive individuals, Y, and the adult reproductive individuals. Movement from one node to the other can occur through different pathways, but along the structure of the network, either along the same network, if you are uh, a, a fish, or even overland, if you are an amphibian, for instance, in certain stages of your life. You take into account local demographic processes, birth, growth, and death, and the dispersal dynamics in each node of a river network, which again, using the full constraining power uh, of, uh, uh, of a system of this kind. Now, this is important to explain the so-called uh, the, 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 the drift paradox, because to explain uh, the long-term dispersal in system in which the drift could be very significant, in fact, um, there, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, is something which ecologically puzzled ecology for a long time. For instance, to explain the long-term persistence of populations, uh, uh, um, uh, for instance, empirically documented uh, examples came in, for, for instance, for Scandinavian freshwater ecosystems, insect species that compensate the larval drift that is transported passively along the river network with upstream directed flight of adults prior to OV position. And uh, it's called the Müller's colonization cycle. Um, uh, otherwise, an excess production hypothesis has been thought in which drifting organisms would be exceeding the balance of demography of a local scale, which implicitly assumes that drift essentially represents an extra mortality terms of these kinds. But anyways, uh, all I'm saying is that what is new here is not the ecology, which is well known, but is the fact that you're using a substrate of this kind. And to give an example of how coupled are these, in this case two, for every node. At node I, you have the young, uh, uh, the number of young non-reproductive individuals and the number of adult reproductive individuals. They have a certain uh, mortality term, possibly density dependent. You have, um, in what you have most important, you have the, the, the probability of dispersing from any J site. So you may have adults at site I can be taken because of the connectivity matrix for any site J by simple proportion and transport that you have in the system. Whereas in the case of the adults, in addition to that, you have reproduction terms. It's not important actually how you do that or, or the specifics of that, which is um, very well known uh, uh, system that uh, we have in, in this place here. But what I'm showing you is the fact that how do you study those systems? is two equations per n nodes of a river network. So you can actually assume that um, those matrices, dispersal matrices are probability which depends on the connectivity structure, something which you assign and give offline, and which you can study by studying the stability uh, of the, the metapopulation meta persistence is actually related to its so stability of a population that is, if a state X0 is stable, the population cannot persist in any of the river network nodes. If it is unstable, juvenile and adult abundances grow uh, uh, and, and they uh, grow the multi-population persistence. So you can study uh, the global equilibrium of those matrices, which is essentially, it's a, it's a super Jacobian in which you have two N by two N matrices that can be done exactly and calculate the survival and the non-survival of the different ranges of the system. And um, what, um, for instance, one particular case, which was particularly interesting was a study of salamanders for which you had empirical data from, uh, uh, I think it was in Virginia someplace, in which you can relate the conditions for metapolation to persist and metapolation not to persist, counting on the fact that the, that the juvenile uh, and the adults have different ability to jump off the river network itself. I am uh, almost done, regretfully, so I will compensate um, uh, next uh, thing, but give me uh, three minutes to complete with another example, the invasion of the zebra mussel, which paves the way of something which I'll be showing you uh, Friday. That is, what you're seeing here, it was um, um, 
the zebra mussel was by accident um, introduced in the Mississippi Missouri River Basin um, by uh, introduction. It was uh, taken from the uh, belligers that are the, the, the larvae that were introduced in ballast water of cargo ships that came in from uh, Europe where it was native. And it started spreading through the system, reaching see the DTAs, if invaded uh, hydrologic units in the system have been growing dramatically over the, over the years, so up to a point. What is totally remarkable about this is the fact that um, at a certain point, it didn't even simply diffuse or disperse downstream. All of a sudden, you started having places where you started having um, uh, flare ups of invasions in completely unrelated places far away from it. That introduces the fact that we can study river networks uh, fairly well uh, in those systems. And um, um, essentially the local reaction equation is the local, local age growth model in four stages, which have larval production. Transport of larvae is a passive, larvae are small, the veligers are essentially passive scalars. So they diffuse and they are vected to the river network, uh, to the river network. But most important, you have to introduce what is called modernly a multiplex network. Why? Because in those recreational ponds in which you put some boats, what happens is that if a guy picks up a boat, doesn't empty its ballast water properly, put it on the trailer and brings it thousands of kilometers away, then in as much as COVID-19 spread through human mobility, so did the spread of this system here. So the long story short on which I shall stop in time, uh, regretting that uh, I have uh, dedicated too much time to the early phases, but um, I will be uh, saying this, what I miss from here uh, next Friday. So here is the computer that simulated uh, values in uh, like in this case, and these are measured and these are computed as you see in here, um, only by our ability to introduce those long range flights generated in the injection by uh, a, a different network, which is not related to the topology of a river network, but related to the road infrastructure and a certain probability of making a distance uh, in the system, you are able to calculate one of the most uh, devastating because zebra mussel um, grew at a level of density that generated a, a significant uh, damage, not only ecological because it displaced every other um, native species of that kind, but it also generated clogging of uh, hydropower plants production and the likes. And this is an example of how, in fact, uh, um, uh, biological invasions um, reach the place. Yeah, this is a good point to stop in here. So the point line is that, and I will be um, taking on uh, the next class to see how this, in fact, becomes the essence for studying through the same environmental matrix and possibly a multiplex network in which pathogens disperse uh, waterborne, I mean, through the network, and human mobility spreads the disease. How, in fact, you can use oriented graphs, nodal reactions, and hydrologic, uh, the hydrologic transport um, to tackle individuals or meta populations or meta communities. Now I'm ready for your questions. Great. Thanks a lot, uh, Andrea, for the very, very nice uh, lecture. So we have uh, time for questions. So please, uh, if you want to ask one, you can use the raise and uh, feature or you can type it in the, in the chat. Yes, please, Monde. Um, can we hear me then? Monde. Can you hear me? Yes, I do. Barely, but I can. Yeah, okay. Yeah, can you hear me, sir? I, I do. Okay. Um okay. So I, I'm I'm looking at the last the last point you presented in the slide. Is it or do I join the class not to uh, at the point you started? Is it that the, the network of of of, of the, the 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 model that you brought was validated before you presented the result of the data or is it a, a direct impute without valid, uh, validation? Uh, it's a good question actually. What happens is the following, okay. There are networks and networks in this case. If you're talking about the transport of, um, it's, uh, in, you, you see the main point, right? 
you have nodes in which you have physical, chemical, biological reactions, right? And then, and you have transport along the network structure. Now, if you're talking about uh, the dispersal of the organism in the, in the larval form, for instance, they are small seeds. They behave like a passive scalar. So they diffuse and they are directed and diffuse along the river network, right? But if you get a bunch of them and you take them from a node and you transport it completely artificially into another node, like you do if a, with the valleys that get trapped in the ballast water uncleaned of a boat, then is the mechanism that can explain why you can actually have a flare up of a, of a, uh, of a proliferation of a zebra mussel hundreds of kilometers away without any in between. Why this is interesting? Because it's like reseeding the infection, if you want, or the uh, density of a population somewhere else. Now, in one case, the network is essentially the physical substrate, which we know directly, right? Because we, that, that's unavoidable. Digital terrain maps allow you to extract those connectivity matrices, that is how a node is connected to any other node in the system. And you can actually distinguish um, whether you, for instance, um, you can also uh, go, you have a preferential transport downstream, but you may even go upstream with a probability which is different. So you have a bias transport. I'll be talking about that uh, uh, Friday. But in the case of a, of a mobility network generated by the other, you have to find something else. So in that case, what we did was to uh, evaluate the kernel of dispersion, but it was calibrated on the data actually, uh, which is the displacement of commercial boats into the place through some proxy, which is um, a, a data on the number of boats parked in different positions of the Mississippi, Missouri River Basin. So when, whereas in the case of a river network, uh, it's a given, the connectivity matrix is given once and for all because it's extracted objectively, it's added remotely and objectively manipulated. In the other case, you may have to make assumptions. When we'll be talking about human mobility, for instance, to spread disease, which is not unlike these, you will have two possibilities. One, assume one of the models that are normally used, uh, like gravity models, radiation models, you name it. Or you may use cellular phones and track individual mobility of large numbers, now you can. Now, in that case, you may wonder whether the use of a telephone in certain places where cholera spreads is socially biased or not, if you're looking at only certain segments of a population. But mind you, my experience is that's not the case. But it's actually socially neutral, the ownership of a phone, even in the most dilapidated place on earth. And I've seen it with my eyes, and I'll tell you next week. Okay, oh, okay so um, um, th thank you so much for the explanation. That I will appeal if, if there's maybe a kind of a reference material, then I, I would like to, to, to read more into it. I'd be delighted. Well, actually, if, if I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, selling anything because all the money will go to Cambridge University Press. But the book that I just published that uh, with Marino Gatto and Ignacio Rodriguez y Turbe is called The River Networks as Ecological Corridors, Species, Population, Pathogens, had everything that we have done in the past 15 years on the subject. And, and a reference, hopefully, a good review of the literature as well. Thank you, Monday. Great. Thanks a lot for the question and the answer. Um, so we have time for uh, more questions, um, if any. Also on YouTube, you can type the question if you want. Well, otherwise, I think we are actually on time. So otherwise, uh, thanks again uh, uh, very much, Andrea, for the for the lectures and looking forward for the next one. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. Hey, if I want to listen to Marino, can I stay on here? Absolutely, yes. Okay, okay. Yes. So what we're gonna do now is that we are taking a, a break before the, before Marino